everyone. Welcome to episode 26 of What to Think, the technology news podcast from VentureBeat.com. I'm your host, Dylan Tweeney, the editor-in-chief of VentureBeat. And I'm Richard Riley, a reporter at VentureBeat. Today we're going to be talking to Steve Jurvetson. He's a venture capitalist and uh, sits on the boards of SpaceX and Tesla Motors, and he was the founding VC behind Hotmail and a whole bunch of other things. But first, we're going to talk about some of the hot news stories that we're looking at this week on VentureBeat. Let's start with BitTorrent Sync, a story that came out just uh, in the last day or two. BitTorrent Sync is uh, BitTorrent's alternative to cloud-based storage. So it uses the BitTorrent protocol, which normally is used for file sharing, except in this case, it's used for private file sharing so that you can move files from one computer to another over the internet. Well, according to BitTorrent's website, they did some speed tests and they claim that Sync performed eight times faster than Google Drive, 11 times faster than OneDrive from Microsoft, and 16 times faster than Dropbox in synchronizing files. So VentureBeat writer Emil Protolinsky decided to test this He grabbed four episodes of The Wire, totaling a bit more than 1.3 gigabytes, transferred the file from his laptop to his Windows desktop, or maybe the other direction. Anyway, the whole process was done in one minute and six seconds, which is incredible speed. It was a bit slower when he actually had to go over the internet, but still substantially faster than Google Drive, OneDrive, and Dropbox. Rich, would you switch to BitTorrent Sync? I've used BitTorrent uh, in terms of uh, movie downloads and so forth with regards to... Uh, Legitimate ones, I'm sure, right? Of course. Uh, and here, Emil mentioned The Wire. If, in fact, his his research is, is accurate, then that's something that Google Drive and Dropbox uh, should be paying attention yeah, to. Yeah, I, so I it's think promis- so. It's, it's incredibly promising, and it's it sounds like a true disruptor, if it's actually true. I have no reason to doubt Emil's tests. Oh, of course, your mileage may vary when you do it yourself. The thing to keep in mind here is BitTorrent Sync goes from computer to computer. So you're not actually storing something in a central cloud server, which is probably why it's faster. The downside is both of your computers have to be on at the same time if you want to sync files between them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's making me take it seriously if I want to transfer something quickly from one computer to another or just sync up my music collection between laptops at home, for instance, I think I'm going to use that. Are you going to try it? Have you tried it? I've tried it, but I haven't used it heavily. I'm going to do some speed tests now, though. That's interesting. Yeah. Moving on to our next story, Amazon recently released two new Fire HD tablets, and they are cheap. The six-inch Fire Slate is $100, and the seven-inch model goes for $140. Our reviewer, Devendra Hardawar, took a look at them, and he concluded that they're not particularly pretty. They're not particularly light. They're sort of more brick-like and chunky than the iPad mini and, you know, other slicker devices you can get. But for the price, this is far and away the best deal in the tablet world right now. There was a shortcoming, though. There's some hidden costs if you want your tablet to be truly competitive. There's advertising. Yeah. So the, one of the reasons they make it so cheap is they're advertising supported. You, know, you can pay $15 if you want to turn off the ads on the lock screen if those annoy you. And they don't have much storage either. Production costs are, are presumably a lot lower than the price points, but what it shows is that Amazon has made a huge commitment to the tablet market. And I think that if you look at the first production variants of the Kindle, I mean, they were pretty pretty primitive. Mm-hmm. And we're going only back maybe four years. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great business idea and plan to continue to develop their own line of tablets and readers because people are going to say, uh, you pay 500 or you can pay 150. Exactly. And and there's a lot of people that, that obviously have been buying. That'll pay 150, yeah, exactly. exactly. And Amazon pushes these like crazy too. I mean, you it's hard to go on to Amazon these days without being faced with a big advertisement for a Kindle of some sort or another, mm-hmm. whether a Fire tablet or a Kindle reader. Let's move on to a guest post by VentureBeat contributor Vivek Wadhwa. He's also on, teaches at Singularity University and is a, an entrepreneur with a, a pretty long track record and a business school professor. He wrote a piece, which I think is worth reading, titled Why Silicon Valley Needs to Join the Battle Against Ebola. And it was kicked off because Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, recently announced a $25 million donation to the Centers for Disease Control Foundation to help fight this disease which uh, so far has killed thousands of people in Africa and uh, just one or two in the United States. But because the disease is so terrifying and so, so fatal to the people who do contract it, 
it's worthy of a lot of concern. And Wadwa's argument is that, you know, Ebola is just sort of a, a prelude of, of a future in which humanity is tightly connected through uh, travel of all kinds, air travel and otherwise, that local epidemics break out frequently and can spread globally within hours. And he says we need to be prepared for this scary future. And Silicon Valley needs to take the lead in developing tech to track, prevent, and manage pandemics and maybe prevent them before they happen. He mentions u- utilizing social media as a kind of a template to get CDC and other uh, respective countries, CDCs, to actually start tracking and logging individual data, which I think is, is fascinating and, and, and long overdue. And he brings up very good points as to why the Valley has yet to completely embrace this. And I think Mark Zuckerberg's lead, he's very interested in education uh, and medicine. His wife is, a, is going to be a doctor soon, I guess. So this is, this is fascinating to me. And I think props, you know, we, we should give a lot of respect to, to Zook for making that donation. I think one of the things uh, about Silicon Valley is that, you know, there's not such a clear profit motive in creating health technologies that can help educate and communicate uh, and help with public health measures that might curtail an epidemic like this. But it's something that the Valley has the capability of addressing and the tech industry really ought to be doing something about. Actually, I may be giving short shrift to the profit uh, opportunity there. There may be more potential for profit than I'm giving credit for in health IT overall, some of which could be used to help stop epidemics. Uh, This is going to be a topic of large discussion at VentureBeat's Health Beat conference, which is coming up October 27th and 28th in San Francisco. And check events.venturebeat.com for more information on HealthBeat. It's going to be a really great lineup with some some excellent innovators and entrepreneurs and executives in the field of technology and, and healthcare. For all this and more tech news, go to VentureBeat.com, where we publish 30 to 50 stories a day about what's happening in the technology industry and what you need to know about it. Before we go to our guest, I'd like to take a minute to thank the host and sponsor of this podcast, New Relic. They're sponsoring the podcast, and it's also in their studio in their San Francisco offices where we record this most weeks. New Relic is a software analytics company that makes sense of billions of data points, about millions of applications, all in real time. Its comprehensive SaaS-based software analytics platform empowers developers, IT, and business leaders to transform their business all by using real-time data directly from production software. Now I'd like to welcome our guest, Steve Jurvetson. He's a partner at the venture capital firm Draper Fisher Jurvetson, and he sits on the boards of SpaceX, Tesla Motors, Synthetic Genomics, among others. He was the founding VC investor in Hotmail, you might have heard of that, as well as Interwoven, Kana, Neophotonics, and a bunch of other companies that have been acquired for $12 billion in aggregate, uh, the ones that are not named on that list. And he was previously an R&D engineer at Hewlett Packard, where he actually designed chips and seven of his communications chip designs were fabricated. So, Steve, thank you very much for joining us on What to Think today. Thank you. Happy to be here. I guess the first question I want to ask is, you know, you have a couple um, investments in Elon Musk companies, Tesla and SpaceX. So I'm just going to cut right to the chase and say, you know, what what is it about Elon and why are you so bullish on this guy? Yeah, Steve, and real quick, describe your relationship meeting him and then go into what Dylan was asking about. Sure. Yeah, we we met, I think, on his first week or two here in California when he was leaving Pennsylvania and and ostensibly starting up at Stanford, but uh, didn't, and in fact, uh, decided to start Zip2 instead. And we've invested in both his company, SolarCity and Tesla and SpaceX, as well as his cousins, the Rive brothers, who are, you know, as you know, running SolarCity and before that, Everdream, where I was on the board as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that company, by the way, was sold to Dell, in in case it's maybe the less well-known of the the group we just mentioned. So Mm -hmm. we have invested in many of the things he's done and have kept in touch over the decades. I have incredible respect for him. I think of him not only as, of course, a national hero and treasure, but one of those sort of archetypes that we seek in the venture industry, those rare unicorns, you might say, of personality that just defy definition. I mean, if you think of it, here's an immigrant from South Africa, comes, you know, leaves South Africa at at the age of 17 by himself to Canada, back to the U.S., takes on industry after industry, each of which has been a proven bad area for venture capital investment, right? The automotive sector, the military industrial complex, you know, regulated utilities. Banking even before that, right? Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, every one of these is like, 
a no-fly zone by conventional wisdom. In every case, he comes as an outsider with no prior experience or expertise per se, thinks of a system solution and elegant re-engineering of how things are done and takes on the most powerful entities in the U.S. economy and now in the global economy, if you think of, of SpaceX and who their competitors are, it's you know, China and Russia. <laughs> like, yeah. This is it's breathtaking. Huge. It's amazing to see right now, and his talents are obvious, right? He's kind of a modern-day Tony Stark. He's the closest thing, or a, a real-life Tony Stark, right? He's the closest thing that we have to, you know, a guy, you know, a guy who's capable of building a, building a rocket suit and flying around fighting crime, right? <laughs> That's right. But did you see that in the beginning? I mean, what, I, I mean, how did you know to bet on him the first time you bet on him? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So it was, there was something quite memorable because even though we didn't invest in Zip2, he's one of the few, he and his brother were both pitching it at the time, Kimball and, and Elon. I very vividly remember the meeting. I remember lines from his business plan. It's, it's not something that I would remember in a company we didn't invest in. Um, but I can't tell you what it was when we first met. I wish I could. I wish I could say, hey, parents, here's what you should try to encourage your <laughs> kids. And then they, too, could be like Elon. My gosh, how I wish I could do that. I can say that from retrospect, so it's very hard in the moment to tell you why I believed he was going to do what he could do uh, with, let's say, Tesla and SpaceX, for example, other than the general answer, which I give for several entrepreneurs, which is there was something about the infectious enthusiasm that he had for the subject that says, you know, he gets you hopping out of your own seat in enthusiasm for this vision. The boldness of the vision, mm-hmm. right? First, all vehicles on the planet will be electric. Every vehicle, every mm-hmm. plane, train, automobile will be electric. Unquestionably, there is no doubt it's a question of when and how, not if. Or that we will colonize Mars, not just go to Mars, not just pe- people on Mars, but send a million people to Mars and make humanity a multiplanetary species. These are big, hairy dishes goals writ large. I can totally say entrepreneurs change the world. He, he says, why start, stop here? Let's change other worlds too, right? Yeah, um, right. So, so you combine that personality of um, not, you know, not bombast, not like auditorium-based demagoguery like a Steve Jobs would have, but more a quiet engineering confidence building from first principles to say, here's why I can calmly, collectively convince you that this is an inevitable trajectory of the future, and then chain back to the present and say, therefore, we must do product X, Y, and Z, and it will be a great success. Hmm. To get there, yeah. Yeah. You, you have a personal interest in rockets, too, right? And I know that from looking at your Flickr feed, you've launched, you know, as a hobbyist, right? I would, I hesitate right. to say hobbyist, because you some of the rockets you've launched are quite big. You have some eclectic interests and some some kind of exciting interests. I don't I don't know. Does that does that lead your your investment thesis? Are you or is that just sort of something on the side that you do that's fun? You know, it's it's interesting. It used to be on the side that's fun, just being a geek as I am. With the intro you gave, hopefully someone will conclude I'm I'm a deep seated geek at heart. <laughs> And, you know, when my son turned three, we just started doing rockets, and we've been doing it now for 11 years, and it's, it's a hobby got out of control, I guess you could say, it's been you know, bigger and bigger rockets. But uh-huh. um, I didn't think there was an intersection between that and work other than the occasional person I met there who was doing a software company or doing something, you know, in the more traditional sectors we invest in. And for the first, you know, eight years or so that I looked around, I never saw a space-related business plan that seemed to warrant even a first meeting with the partnership here. So we never had any company that got to the point of let's, let's have them meet other people. Mm-hmm. And that all changed with SpaceX. I, the hobby relation, by the way, is like, well, yeah, I, I think rockets are cool. And like, maybe I had a bit more of a prepared mind and, a, and a, especially with the space collection of stuff I have at the office, a bit of a geeky interest in this, but it was after investing in SpaceX and getting a firsthand view and frankly, believing the way Elon does that the trajectory of his industry is going to lower the cost of access to space to the point where it's kind of like flying an airplane, not such a bizarre thing that only governments and billionaires could think to do. Yeah. Uh, something that's available to everyone if they had a reason to go to space. Well, if that's true, then all kinds of other investment opportunities opened up beyond SpaceX itself, like Planet Labs in the satellite sector and, and other satellite companies that we've been talking with more recently. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like uh, when you have the fiber optic lines for the internet, then come the, you know, the applications and the, and the cloud services. Well, you sort of, the fiber optic lines like access, they call it access in, the, in that industry. And the same for space access. Once you have access, there's a lot of things you can do yeah. uh, that become now an industry, not a one-off investment. Prior to SpaceX, I couldn't have said any of that would have happened. It was sort of, it was the, the choke point for the industry moving forward. Yeah. It certainly seems that SpaceX has moved very fast from kind of, I can't believe these guys are trying to do this 
to, oh my God, they just got a multi-billion dollar contract with NASA. Right. And Steve, it's like NASA's going to, to Elon, right? To SpaceX. Like it's work together. It's not the other way around, right? NASA kind of needs uh, SpaceX to a degree or no? I mean, I don't want to paint it as need. They, they, you know, if SpaceX didn't exist, they'd probably find some other company, but it may not be as compelling a solution. But I think if you generalize the statement, the space industry has matured to the point where NASA as a agency doesn't need to own and operate its own rockets to get its missions done, to explore other planets, to send satellites to other the world. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting, I think, is maybe maybe pe people associate astronauts themselves with a NASA thing, because in the Apollo era, that's what astronauts were. They were NASA people. And with the shuttle and with commercial space, you see, you know, some variation, but still people, I think, cling to that notion that astronauts are NASA. But with, you know, the Boeing and SpaceX awards that have occurred, you know, it's pretty much the case. The future of the U.S. space program is betting on those companies for the launch vehicles. But there's still much that else that NASA can do. And in a way, it, it frees them from, like, if you're an explorer, you don't want to have to always build your own boats or your own rockets. Right. It would be great if there were <laughs> off-the-shelf solutions that you could just buy at effectively, you know, much lower prices than you were ever paying before. That's all good for NASA. Yeah. Um, and the whole separate question is, okay, what are they going to explore? What are they going to do? That's, that's a different question. But You're not making the argument that some people say, which is that, you know, NASA's time is over and now let's, let's privatize and, and let, the, let private industry take it, take it over. I mean, you're saying they still have a role to play. It's just, you know, they shouldn't necessarily be building launch vehicles. Oh, exactly. I mean, I don't think the private sector is in any position to take up the core missions of, of exploring new worlds and finding out, like, you know, does life exist on other planets? What's under that ice sheet in Europa, the moons of Jupiter? It's, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of places still to explore. And then an interesting question could be, well, if NASA were to say, yep, we're going to devote the energy and resources it takes to put people on Mars, then a question could come, to what extent did they rely on industry suppliers? But if, you know, short of that, if they're going to talk about asteroid redirect or whatever it is they want to do, it's different kind of stuff. So I think there's a whole separate question. Is, is there a moonshot equivalent that NASA should put a lot of weight behind? And if so, what? Right. And there, you know, people debate that. When we got together last time and talked, you told me that the almost the entire impetus for uh, launching SpaceX, creating it was the objective of getting a manned mission to Mars. Is that true? And if it's so, can you elaborate on that? So the founding vision of SpaceX was even more specific. It was to put a greenhouse on Mars to have a camera sending video or stills back to Earth, and then it was done. Hmm. Mission accomplished. Literally, that was the sum total of what Elon envisioned doing, at least you know, with the $100 million he put into it. So he provided 100% of the money, $100 million, to achieve that goal. He then went to Russia negotiating to repurpose ICBMs, you know, nuclear ballistic missiles, to send this mission to Mars, and basically negotiated a deal, but then got yanked around and really had a distasteful, you know, sort of experience that one often has when negotiating with monopoly suppliers of, well, the price is changing, right? And so then he said, from first principles, why is this rocket so expensive? You know, you take the rocket price and you look at the raw materials going in and the cost of goods is only 3% of the rocket. He could find no other industry that was that inefficient, meaning mm. it wasn't because of patents or proprietary stuff. It's like you take aluminum, you take this material, you bend it into various tubes and vessels, and boom, you mark it up you know, by this enormous <laughs> margin. You you know, 10x and still have a 70% gross margin in a pretty good business. And I can wow. think of a few reasons why there might be a big markup, of, you know, because... Well, exactly. <laughs> you know, you're going to put a person on top of that <laughs> tube of aluminum with explosives in it. Right. Is it proven to be safe? Is right. it the known? Exactly. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But he looks at it like a physicist and says, this is yeah. crazy. And especially if my goal is a greenhouse, I don't have to worry about that safety thing to right. start. I eventually have to get there. But day one, I just want to build a cheap rocket to get up in the orbit. So when are we going to get a greenhouse on Mars? Well, that's a great question. So the SpaceX trajectory and mission is, or dream is still the same. There's an enormous image of Mars uh, you know, right at the front lobby that everyone passes by as they walk into work each day. And that is the prize. But when you chain back to the present from that, you need to solve a few problems. You need to make you know, a space capsule that's man-rated, as they call it, which is, you know, able to take people and, you know, re-enter our atmosphere if need be. And that's the current NASA-funded mission to, you know, reinvigorate the succession vehicle to the space shuttle. Um, once you have that, you then, of course, need to, you know, get to Mars, which isn't that much harder, but you need the Falcon Heavy rocket, which should be flying, hopefully, with some point here in 2015. That's 
the same as their existing rocket, but you just strap on two side boosters that are identical to the central core, so no new engine, no new fundamental design other than the system design that you can have three bodies lifting instead of one, mm-hmm. and also some really clever stuff going on with how they pump fuel between those cores, but we can get that only if you care for that level of detail. There's yet another innovation being introduced at that point. Mm-hmm. So once you have a rocket that's big enough, you know, kind of like the Apollo rockets and Saturn Vs of, of, of old, to send meaningful payloads to um, Mars... What's interesting is that Elon's thought so far ahead to this future that he's done two things. First, you've got to be able to get back with fuel you make on Mars, and there haven't been enough dinosaurs <laughs> and uh-huh. enough oil to pump that uh-huh. you can't use kerosene. <laughs> oil so they're shifted to methane, methane and oxygen, so you can make the fuel to get back there, which is yes. kind of cool. The second is you need to actually just get your depreciated assets down. In other words, you think hundreds of thousands of missiles or rockets going to Mars if you could get there and back in a single um, alignment of the planets versus a one-way trip, you suddenly double the utilization rate of your assets. I mean, it's like a pure, mm. uh, it's almost like a supply chain logistics optimization level of analysis that now is driving the imperative for a variety of propulsion systems and reusability so that you literally could fly, reload, fly back all with a fast turnaround time. Mm. And then, of course, come all the other big questions. You know, how, you know are you going to live in caves? Are you going to live in a, you know, some sort of geodesic dome? Are you going to try to terraform the environment to be, you know, friendly to humans in, in a crater, in a region, for the whole planet, on yeah. the time scale? Those are big questions to come. But amazingly, by the way, Elon doesn't waste time on all those questions now, which would be many years prior to the relevance. He is entirely focused at the beginning of that chain I just described. Get the Falcon Heavy working, getting the man-rated Dragon Castle working. Because if you don't get those working, it doesn't matter if you do or don't have the solution for how to terraform Mars. We'll get to that later. Right. And the technology available to us, especially at the rate of biotech's advancing, will be so much better that we'll, we'll visit that problem when it's relevant. He's just thinking far enough ahead to, you know, to be able to solve the problems that he knows he needs to solve now, such as what kind of fuel and how to make the logistics work out for the return exactly. trip. Exactly. So, yeah. like, 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 if you're at the stage of, I need a rocket, he does look far enough ahead to think about, you know, methane instead of kerosene. You know, mm-hmm. big difference on, you know, on how you get fuel from Mars. So that's an important driver to the current design. But he doesn't waste time, frankly, on all of the interesting questions that a science fiction buff might want right. to, you know, <laughs> focus on, which is, what do you do when you get there? Right. Let's come back to Earth, and uh, I, I want to ask <laughs> you about... Uh, about Tesla and kind of how, how its progress is so far and how, how you'd, you'd state that. I mean, certainly an amazingly well-rated car. It's a beautiful design. It, by all accounts, drives really well. I think the highest ever score in Consumer Reports, which is no softy when it comes to reviewing cars. But in terms of the, that goal of making every vehicle on the planet electric, how well is Tesla doing? There are a couple of vectors where Tesla could help towards that goal. One is to do it directly, to make cars that are electric and have large numbers of people buy them. The second is to inspire others to follow. And in mm-hmm. theory, you could have a lot more leverage in the latter. And so people might have mixed opinions on how rapidly the rest of the automotive industry is embracing this as the future. And for a variety of good reasons, you might imagine they might be laggards in that mm-hmm. it is almost the most universal law of business that the people at the top of any given industry sector are the least likely to radically disrupt the apple cart. And if it's gas burning cars, that's the modus operandi, then they're going to be some of the last to move. Yeah. Nevertheless, you know, I would expect that you will see other automotive companies start to have an electric car program. In fact, if you look far enough in the future, you'd say, when will the first major automotive company announce the end of their gas burning fleet? Because it yeah. have to happen at some point. It's kind of an interesting thought experiment. Um, the alternative hypothesis is that they just don't move uh, and, and entrepreneurs and new entrants take the charge. So, for example, yeah. in China, there are 200 million electric vehicle drivers, and I would predict that by the end of 2015, there are more EV drivers in China than there are drivers in America, but these are not four-wheel vehicles for the most part. These are Vespa-like scooters and e-bikes. But mm, when asked interesting. why they bought what they bought, it was because they feared SARS during that outbreak on mass transit. So they didn't want to go on bus or anything that was mass transit. Uh-huh. And when they switched to an electric vehicle, they realized it was actually lower cost of ownership all in than paying the public bus fare. <laughs> and when asked what they would have done if they didn't have an electric scooter, which had privileged access to city streets and sidewalks, kind of like a commute lane, you can actually ride on the sidewalk, mm-hmm. um, if you only with those vehicles, not with gas burning um, those motorcycles, they said they would have bought a car. So this is 200 million people that on average would have probably bought some kind of a car 
if not for the regulation and cheapness of electric two-wheeled vehicles. 1,300 manufacturers. Yeah, that's amazing. A big effect. You know, as a consumer, I'm not a Tesla driver. I, I haven't quite achieved that income bracket yet, but I've dipped my toe into electric car driving because we bought a hot plug-in hybrid, right? So it burns gas on longer trips, but we can plug it in overnight. And just that was enough for us to see how much more efficient, how much cheaper driving on electricity is. And that's without even sort of rethinking the type of vehicle that we're driving, right? So that's a that's a really interesting right. point. If you can sort of get people to see the economic advantage, or there's some some reason for them to go outside the usual way of thinking, as in China, then you kind of sells itself. Yeah. And Steve, exactly. real quick, with regards to Tesla, you know, you have this <laughs> relationship going back a long time with Elon, based on respect for his vision and stuff. Do you think it's fair to say that the entire American auto manufacturing sector? looks at Tesla as a threat or as is competition to their oil-based engine models? This is my own personal view. Is not by, by the way, the full disclosure, I'm on the board of Tesla, so I need to pause right. before answering to make sure I don't, you know, say anything, you know, somebody make really sure this is my own personal <laughs> point of view. And it's, only, and, it's, and it's only, frankly, based not on first-hand knowledge. It's not like I've actually gone, think about it, like I don't get the answer to your question. I don't get to walk into these companies and see what they actually say. I could only see, for example, what their dealers say, which is so far removed from corporate headquarters that it doesn't really reflect, right? So you can always walk in and ask them, hey, what do you guys think about electric cars? When are you going to have one? You know, you'll hear some mm-hmm. answer that may have nothing to do with what the car company is doing. Mm-hmm. I do know of at least one major car company that may be taking it seriously and may try to produce a compelling electric vehicle. I only know of one. Which one is that? Uh, I shouldn't say. Oh, um, but say it anyway. I know it is kind of weird. No, no, it's, it's just because the CEO of this company drives a Tesla and lives his life. And uh, they're seeing what you're seeing. <laughs> Interesting. That's fascinating. But it's a long ways off. So it's, this is by no means something that anyone should consider as information that you know is relevant. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. my point is, I know of one, there may be others. But here's what I would say. Even if there's one where the CEO wants to do it, that doesn't mean the product will ever see the light of day. Because my general answer to your question would be, big companies like that are the last and slowest movers, it would, it's going to have to be so painfully obvious that they've already missed the boat before they go whole hog into something like this because mm-hmm. it's so contrary to their current competencies. Imagine your GM, huh? right? What kind of risks do you feel like taking right now on new suppliers, on new technologies, on things that are a little different, right? right. How many software engineers do you have? None. When I say none, what, they, what they don't really but, have none, but, but yes, compared to They don't to have a competency in that. They've long right. since outsourced to Delphi, Continental, and Bosch all of the things that you think of as a software control system, like you know, analog brake control systems, and, and that's not in-house. And so that's why mm. you don't see elegant software solutions coming from major auto OEMs. The, the, why are the dashboards and everything just so clunky user yeah. interfaces, so not Apple, right, in every sense of the word? They don't want to take the risk of cannibalizing their existing revenues either. So Exactly. exactly. So, it's a classic innovator's dilemma. They yep. just never would. It's just like Google would never blow up and re-engineer search engine marketing and ad right. matching. It's like that's their bread and butter. They're not going to mess with that. They'll mess with other industries, right? Yeah. So, Steve, we're almost out of time, but uh, in in the last couple minutes, could you just tell us quickly sort of what areas of investment you're focusing on these days? Oh, sure. It may seem like an eclectic blend. So one way, the way most VCs might think of it is well, by industry. So it's robots and drones and satellites and <laughs> rockets and cars and agricultural biotech mm-hmm. and software to change how we design buildings and chips to uh, accelerate deep learning algorithms. Oh, and human longevity extension and uh, gene sequencing equipment and gene synthesis equipment and uh, industrial chemical production, re-engineering pigs to make them uh, immunocompatible with humans so you could do organ transplants, creating omega-3 rich oils from bacteria, uh, we're using algae from waste and also cyanobacteria, uh, creating synthetic rubber from, um, yeah, okay, so that's very that might eclectic. Seem like those are eclectic, but <laughs> there is a method to the madness. What I, what I generally try to do is invest in, in, in process themes, like how do engineers build complex systems? Do they do it with new methods like deep learning and machine learning or evolutionary algorithms uh, which are embedded within the the way in which innovations have occurred in each of these industries. So take, for example, Flux, which just announced last week their first little test product, uh, or the first product of many, let's just say. Uh, it was a Google X spin-out, the first of many. But the reason, there, like, there's almost a mind meld between myself and stuff going on at Google, is they have that similar process a filter, I believe, for everything they do, which is how can you use machine learning deep learning on massive free data sets to produce new products that incumbents 
wouldn't have thought to produce, and especially in large industries. So, you know, building construction, you might think of as far removed from Google's core, and it is mm -hmm. as an industry. But the insight that led to Flux is right in the core of what Google does in every business, which is, you know, how do we take reams of data, use machine learning to come up with interesting solutions in big industries. So, um, and that comes back to dive into one example. Yeah. yeah. So that comes back to to, to a, a process question or a, you know re-engineering exactly. a whole system. Exactly. So how, exactly. And so I'm personally like like the subset of this that I'm most interested in is the whole field of machine learning, or sometimes people get really excited about deep learning, which is the neural network branch mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Which is generally, you know, how do you build software artifacts that exceed human understanding? I mean, that literally are capable of things that no human can possibly understand, and may never understand. Mm -hmm. and, that's a breathtaking breakthrough, a process breakthrough that should lead to and is, you know, all kinds of new products in industries that had been sheltered from competition for decades. So just like Elon, in a way, was a new entrant in a formerly entrepreneur barren area, there are a whole bunch of new ones in agricultural biotech, building construction, and things where hopefully the innovation is so big that my personal ignorance about those markets isn't the important thing, like that'll make or break the investment thesis. Mm -hmm. It's how fundamental is the breakthrough, and if the, and if, sure, the market's big enough that if you could improve how buildings are built, you can sort of wave your hand and you know that's a multi-billion dollar business because it's 19% yeah. of the global GDP and growing. It's, like, it's huge, it's the biggest business on the planet. If you could improve it in some way that you just know it's gonna be a big enough business, so let's just focus on is there a fundamental breakthrough and how things are done that, that you wanna bet on. Okay. Steve, I got a quick question for you. you your mind sure. is like a greyhound on the track. It never stops. How many hours of sleep do you get a night? Seriously, I'm curious. I, oh, I try to get a lot. So it used to be nine hours, and it's now probably about eight and a half. I actually cherish sleep as an essential element to be able to think rationally the next day. So unlike some who just need no sleep and spend more days, more hours of the day thinking, I try to sleep more than the average person and then I'll be rested for the next day. That's right. incredible. I wish I could follow that. <laughs> Discipline, Steve, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Focus sleeping. You know, my cat can do it, so can I. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> Steve Jorvitson, thank you so much for speaking with us on Venture Beats What to Think podcast today. Thank you so much. Good to talk to you. Thanks for everything. All right. Take care, guys. And thank you for listening to What to Think. As always, you can find us online on our home website, VentureBeat.com. And if you haven't subscribed to our podcast in iTunes yet, head on over to iTunes and search for What to Think and subscribe. We'll look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions or comments, and we'll catch you online. Till next week, I'm Dylan Tweeney. And I'm Richard Riley. Catch you later. Mm -hmm.